Matthew chapter 10 is where we will be for all of the next half an hour or so. And so you can park there and hopefully learn some things about Jesus through this. We are getting back into Jesusology. We have taken a break from it just because of a few special messages, and I was out of town for a few weeks. But if you're visiting with us today or just chiming, uh, tuning in a little bit here, we are studying Jesus. This is an ongoing documentary, if you would, about the most important figure of our faith. Jesus Christ is described as the author and finisher of our faith. And so we should know more about Jesus than we know about any other Bible character. We should know more about Jesus than we do any other person in history. We should know more about Jesus than any person in our own life because our faith should be at the center of who we are and it should define who we, who we are and th therefore we should know Jesus very well. And so we're going to continue today to, to study Christ and that requires us to see him for who he is, not for who we want him to be. The one disadvantage with him not being here in the flesh, if you would, where we can ask him questions, we can hear him, we can see him, is it leaves the door open for people to revise history and to create and paint a Jesus that they want him to be. Uh, we do this with people in our life. We try to make them who we want them to be, how they will most um, or best suit us, how they'll most benefit us. And Jesus will not be defined by anyone's desires of who he should be. Jesus is who he is. And we have the scriptures to define that. We have the scriptures to paint that picture for us. And, and that's our goal. And so some things we don't necessarily uh, are inclined to like. Today might be one of those lessons where we see Jesus in a different light than what is typically portrayed in your movies and your shows and probably in modern Christianity from preaching to painting um, let me introduce this message by saying something I think all of us will agree with, and that is no one really likes to be told what to do. N unless we're told to go take that car for free or something, but if we're told to do anything, it can be as simple as go put that tray over there. We just instinctively don't want to be told what to do. I don't think anyone has ever liked to be told what to do, going back to the Garden of Eden, frankly. But since the pandemic, because of the overreaches of the governments of this world, because of the abuse of the governments of this world, I think it's taken it to a whole new level. We really don't want to be told what to do. And we're in a culture now where we don't want someone to tell us to do anything. I, I fear that uh, we, don't, we don't wear seatbelts, some of us, because we're told to do it. Just instinctively, well, now that you told me, I won't. And I fear if the government came out and said, you need to start breathing oxygen, people would suffocate themselves because they don't want to be told what to do. It's just a part of who we are. It's a terrible part of who we are. And we're living in a world where man continues to take the center stage and he becomes God to himself. It's a humanistic society. As we become more important to us and as God becomes less important to us, we refuse to let anyone ultimately tell us what to do. And it is for this reason that I fear modern Christianity prefers to paint the picture of a happy-go-lucky Jesus, a Jesus who is super chill, a Jesus who can just hang out with me at the bar or at my house or on the, on the court or at the football stadium, but Jesus is just like the best. He's, he's almost... And I know this sounds irreverent, but to help, help you understand what I fear is happening is he's, he's almost portrayed the way Snoop Dogg is portrayed on the Caribbean beach with a corona in his hand. It's a fine life, baby. Yeah, that's what he says. And we want to put Jesus in that same position, like he's got his flowing robe, he's got his sandals, he's just, you know, he'll take whatever he can get from us, but he's just here to help us, and it's a fine life, baby. Yeah, it's just that kind of Jesus. And I'm sorry, that's nowhere in Scripture, and I won't portray him that way. Now, at the same time, I don't want to make Jesus out to be anything he's not either by going to the other side. A lot of uh, portraits you might see painted of Jesus, it's common to see him you know, as a very tender man, a very gentle man who has a sheep or a lamb nestled up near him, and he's the gentle shepherd, and he's the meek and lowly Jesus, and he is all of that. And the preaching tends today in our, in our culture to focus on the graciousness of Jesus. And he's all of that. But he's more than that. 
He's not just somebody who will take what he can get and and let you do what you want and have no opinion on it. Jesus was and is laser-focused on very serious and very urgent spiritual matters. I don't doubt that he sat with his disciples and could tell a joke or laugh at a joke, assuming it was clean and pure. I don't doubt that he could uh, reflect on life and relax with his disciples and even rejuvenate himself. I don't doubt that he could sit and eat with publicans and and sinners because we know he did. But I want to make sure that we don't see Jesus in any way as a surfer dude Messiah who can just lay back and let life be life because he wasn't. And so today we're going to see Jesus as the commander, the commander. This is the side of Jesus that casual Christians were just kind of tagging, tagging Christianity onto their life will struggle with. This is the side of Christ that post-pandemic Christians could easily find themselves struggling with. But this is who Jesus is. It is in his nature. We have learned that, that John in chapter one of verse number one, equated Jesus with the creator, meaning he is the creator. And so Genesis chapter one is all about Jesus Christ. That's the first time we see him. And Genesis chapter one is that beautiful account of creation, how everything got here. And do you know how everything got here? With seven commands from Jesus Christ. And day number one, he said, let there be light. And day number two, he said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. That's the universe. That's space. And day number three, we see him saying, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. That's the seas. He also said, let the earth bring forth grass and so on. On day four, he said, let there be lights in the firmament. On day five, he said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature. And day number six, he said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. So Jesus seven times said, let there be, and things were. That was the command of Christ. I know this because of Psalm 33, when the psalmist said, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, let, the all, uh, let all the earth fear the Lord, for he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So when Jesus wants to do something big, he commands. He is the commander. That's in his nature. That's in his DNA. He will not shy away from giving commands. Now, I am pastoring in a PC culture. I'm leading a church in a post-pandemic culture, and I can tell you, I don't think it is in any, any way rare that I feel this way, but I feel like I have to walk on eggshells with people. And I feel like I have to be very careful and very gentle with, with anything I ask. And often people will do things because I ask. And I don't want that to be the, the motivation. I want you to serve the Lord Jesus Christ because he's rewarding you. But, but I feel like it wouldn't take much for me to chase you out of the church. And so I have to be very careful. Jesus is not at all like that. He is not hesitant to give commands. He is not in any way reserved when it comes to giving out commands and orders. He's not apologetic in any way. And and he doesn't feel bad when he says, do this or go there, because that's who he is. If we're not careful this morning, we'll entirely misjudge and misunderstand the person of Jesus Christ. He is a bold leader with very bold commands. Now think about the Gospels with me. Of all the things Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John recorded, did they not record Jesus doing more commanding than suffering? Did did they not record more Jesus telling people to go here or do this or be that than they did record him dying on the cross which was the chief mission of Jesus Christ. Of course, think about how many times he told somebody, whether it was a blind person or a lame person uh, or a disciple or an apostle, to go somewhere. Think about how many times he told his listeners, his audience, to be something. Think about how many times he told uh, different people or groups to do something. There's a lot. 
And I reflected upon that as I researched and studied Christ. All throughout creation, he, he was commanding things to be done. All throughout the Gospels, he was commanding things and people to do something. Just in Luke chapter 8 alone, we see Jesus commanding, the Bible uses that word, the winds and the waves to chill out. A few verses later, we see Jesus commanding, the, word uses that, the Bible uses that word, an unclean spirit to come out of a demonic man. And then not too much later in that same chapter, he then commands the people in a house to give a little girl he just resurrected food. The Bible uses that word three times in one chapter to show Jesus commanding things, evil spirits, and people. Jesus is a commander. He's a bold leader with bold commands. He commanded the winds and the waves, the demons and the devils, the deaf and the dumb, the leper and the lame. He, he commanded the, the dead to come out of the tomb. He commanded the blind to go and show themselves to others. He commanded the 70 disciples and the 12 apostles to do a number of things. Jesus is not afraid to bark out orders. And of course he shouldn't be for he is God. And he reserved that right the moment he brought us into this world. Matthew chapter 10. We're gonna read some things in this passage and I wanna emphasize why Jesus is a commander and why he is going to tell us to do things and why he has every right to tell us to do things and why we should respond to those things. But in Matthew chapter 10, this is Jesus equipping the 12 apostles with power and then he gives them some orders. Verse number five, Matthew chapter 10, the Bible says these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them. Now I've gotta tell you what we're about to read and we're not reading it all in its entirety, but what we're about to read is very specific to the 12 apostles in the nation of Israel at the time of Christ. This is not a command he gives to you and me in 2022 in America. So it's very specific to those men. We can glean things from it. We can apply things from it, but it's very specific to them. So keep that in mind as we read num verse number five again. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but, verse six, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, Preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Number one, Jesus was and is the commander of a rescue mission. Jesus didn't bark out orders or give commands for the fun of it or just to exercise his authority or his divinity. He didn't find it fun to make people do what he want and to feel special about himself and everyone else was below him. No, he, he lost somebody he loved. In fact, he lost a lot of people he loved because in the nation of Israel, people had rejected God. They had rejected uh, the Lord Jehovah and he had come looking for people he loved. And he told his apostles, go. He didn't ask him to go. It wasn't a request. It wasn't a sign up. It wasn't an encouragement. It wasn't an exhortation. It wasn't a recommendation. It was a command. Verse number five, he commanded them, go. He didn't say please. He didn't say pretty please. He didn't promise a cherry after that. He didn't promise a reward. He just said, go. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, it is every parent's worst nightmare, every parent's worst nightmare to lose a child. And by losing a child, I mean you don't know where they are. And when a child is not where they're supposed to be, either as a little child in the grocery store or a teenager in their bedroom, and you don't know where they are and you can't find them, parents naturally become uh, traumatic in their brains and they don't care about formalities. They will scream, they will shout, they will yell, they will bark out orders to the police, they'll bark out orders to family members, uh, they'll establish a search party and they'll say, go, go. They won't care about what the reward is, they wanna find that which is lost because their heart draws them to that. And Jesus Christ is the same when it comes to the lost souls of mankind. This is a rescue mission. This is a rescue mission to find the people that he loves so dearly. I don't know if you've seen the National Geographic documentary entitled The Rescue. 
I'd encourage you to watch it. It's fascinating. It's a documentary that follows the rescue mission of a 2018 uh, Thailand soccer team. There were, I think, 12 of them after a soccer practice that they call football. Uh, they went into these caves, and they were just going to explore, do what teenagers do. I think there were 12 teenagers uh, between the ages of 11 and 16. There was one 25-year-old associate or assistant coach. But they went into the caves, and it wasn't the monsoon season yet, so they could do that, but it began to rain very heavily while they were exploring the caves, just having some, some discovery time with, the, with each other. But they got trapped because the rains came so quickly, and the caves filled up with water. It's amazing because this documentary shows from the moment that they were lost to the moment that they were found but they were stuck in there for two weeks. And it became a national story, of course, but it became a global story. The United States sent over some of our best Navy SEALs to help out the Thailand Navy SEALs over there, the Royal SEALs, they're called. And they tried to rescue these young people. In the process, two Thailand Navy SEALs died. One died because he couldn't get back in time. The other died, of, I think, of a brain aneurysm or some type of... Um, related injuries some months later. But they almost called it off because the monsoon season was coming. When the monsoon season comes, everything fills up in the caves. You can't get in there, and you've got to wait months. So it was going to be a, a different type of a mission should they have boarded that. And two weeks into it, they could not get to them. Two British divers who do this for fun, they just explore caves, they flew to Thailand, and they would make the trip multiple times to try to find them, and eventually, two weeks into it, they found them, two miles from the cave mouth. They got them out. One by one, they had to put gear on these kids and get them out through very difficult terrain. It's a real fascinating, fascinating story. The rescue effort involved more than 10,000 people, including more than 100 divers. Scores of rescue workers, representatives from about 100 governmental agencies, 900 police officers, and 2,000 soldiers, 10 police helicopters, 7 ambulances, more than 700 diving cylinders, and pumping of more than 1 billion liters of water from the caves. Like, that's a mission. You know what they were doing all that time? Taking orders. Somebody was commanding what they were going to do. And it wasn't a time for formalities. There weren't, there weren't requests, who's going to sign up for this event? Who's going who's to do it? No, it was, listen, men, you're going to do this. Listen, you know, ladies, you're going to do this. Listen, everybody, you're going to do this. To make this work, to coordinate everything, it's a matter of you do that and you do that and you do that and do it. Because these kids, these kids and their families are dependent on us. You see, it was a rescue mission that demanded a sense of urgency, and that is exactly what Jesus Christ does when it comes to reaching the lost. He's not going to beg us for our participation. He's not going to be casual about our response. He's not concerned with being labeled unreasonable or too intense or just too much or too mean. He's going to say to all of us, as he does today, go. It's not open for debate. I'm not looking for a compromise. I don't want your ideas. Go. That's where Jesus is. That's the commander who Christ is. Luke chapter 18, don't turn there, but it demonstrates Jesus' approach to the spiritually lost. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus is heading into Jericho. It's a city in the, in the nation of Israel at the time. And as he's heading in, this blind man hears all the commotion. And this blind man says to people nearby, what's all the commotion about? And someone says, it's Jesus. To which he says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the people say, quiet, be quiet. And he screams out the more, and Jesus hears him. And the Bible says that Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. He didn't say, hey, can somebody go get that blind guy and bring him over here? He said, bring him here now. Everybody else told me quiet, but Jesus said, bring him here now. It's not open for debate. I'm not looking for volunteers. Do it. Why? Because this man had the faith to have his eyes restored and his soul saved. Jesus is passionate about saving that which is lost. Jesus 
wants us to go. He is running a rescue mission, and that motivates him to be a commander. Commander. This Saturday, we're heading into the Taste of Isorora. We're going to go there from 12 to 3. We're going to have three one-hour slots. Pastor C has already signed up for the first hour, and he's going to get some teenagers, and they're going to head in there, and and they're just going to hand out a piece of paper. On that piece of paper, on one side, it says, come on to our church for a free chicken barbecue on September 24th. On the other side, it could change somebody's eternal destiny because it explains how to know Christ as your Savior, how to be saved from your sin, and how to have the gift of eternal life. In the second hour, we've got no one signed up. We need four people. In the third hour, we've got two signed up. We need two more people. And and then in two weeks after that, we're going to have the chicken barbecue, and we need more people here to serve the food, to greet people, and to hand them more information that can change their eternal destiny. I'm asking you to join me. I'm asking you to sign up. But Christ is commanding us. He is demanding us because it's a rescue mission. You know, Jesus would not do well in today's society, I promise you. He would not be the pastor of a megachurch because you have, to te- you have to tread thinly and lightly. You've got to be gentle and sensitive to people's feelings. Jesus, when it comes to getting the job done, he says, this is what's expected, do it. He's not concerned with our feelings. We tend to be more concerned with our feelings. Number two, look at verse 16. Jesus is the commander of a royal priesthood. He's the commander of a rescue mission, and he's the commander of a royal priesthood, meaning he's in charge of an army of people who are called priests. Verse number 16, he says to these 12 men after telling them to go, he says, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Jesus is passionate about the going part because that's what he's here to do, to rescue the lost, to save the sinner. But he's equally as passionate about the people doing the rescuing, and that is the being. Meaning, you're going to go, guys and gals, but before you go, i got to equip you, I've got to prepare you, I've got to get you ready for the mission, and you need to be a certain way. Jesus, like a military instructor or a military leader, he doesn't just send people into battle, send people into duty without equipping them with the skills they need to survive that dangerous mission. Look verse number 17. He says to his men, but beware of men. Verse 22 And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Verse 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? You see, believers, if you are a believer this morning, if Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you are called a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are the rescuers in the rescue mission, and we are being sent into a dangerous occupation, spiritually speaking, and Christ says, I want you to survive it. I want you to get through it, but if you're going to get through it, you need to be wise as a serpent. You need to be harmless as a dove. I cannot just give you a gun and have you go off. You'll end up shooting yourself. I have to train you. I have to prepare you. That is my responsibility. And so to do that, Jesus says, I am going to bark out order after order, command after command with no regard for feelings because it is my job to get you ready for battle. I mean, if you go into the Army, and I've not been there, but if you go into the Marines, and I've not been there, but I imagine when you go there, there are men here who can testify, they do not care about your feelings. I used to love that Geico commercial where it's... uh, you know, what, what, what does the Marine sergeant do in a counseling session? And so it has uh, the Marine in a chair and then another guy in a chair, and this, this guy is crying about his problems in life. And, and they pan over to the Marine, and the Marine goes, you know what I think? And he takes the tissue and throws it at his head and just said, grow up or be a, you know, get over it, man, be pamby. He just did the Marine thing. Because Marines don't care about your feelings. They care about your abilities, 
Because when they send you into war, you're not going into war with relational skills. You're going into war with weapons. You're going into war with people that are trying to hurt you, to kill you. And so it is the job of a military commander to prepare their recruits for battle, and therefore they will not baby them. And Jesus does the same for us. You say, well, it sounds kind of mean that he would send us into the battle with wolves. And look at verse number 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And then he says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear you not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Now, this shows up in the middle of a passage where Jesus says, I'm sending you into battle as sheep among wolves. And then he says, don't worry, I've got every hair of your head figured out. Well, that doesn't sound like you're very protective if you're gonna send us in as sheep among wolves. And what we don't see, I want you to see this today, is that Jesus commands us to do things because those commands will keep us alive, spiritually speaking. For example, the Bible says pray without ceasing. The Bible does not say, will you pray without ceasing? The Bible does not say, would you please consider to pray without ceasing? The Bible does not say, would you sign up to pray without ceasing? The Bible says, pray without ceasing. That is not optional, it's necessary. Why? Because you're not going to survive the Christian life without it. We're just not. In the Bible, we read these words, uh, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's not optional. That's a command. No Christian survives the Christian life without being in church on a regular basis, period. Not enough of you are convinced to that, I can tell. It's legit. It's legit. I talk to people in just casual conversation and they'll talk about people I don't know and they'll explain their life and, and they'll explain that they're a Christian and then they'll say, well, things like, you know, they're just not where they need to be or they're struggling with this or struggling with that and I'll just say, well, where do they go to church? Oh, they stopped going a long time ago. Ding. It's not optional. When Jesus says go to church, it's not because he's trying to make you so you know, busy with church that you, have, you don't have time to do everything else. He says you're just not going to survive Christianity without going to church. And so he commands those things. Well, but but you're, don't you know what I have to do this Sunday? I've got things to do around the house. And Jesus, if he were here, would say, I don't care about your house. I care about your soul. And we like to say, well, well, I've got to take so-and-so to practice. And, and Jesus, if he were here, would not be nearly as gentle as you think. He'd not be as gracious as you think. Why? Because he is leading an army of royal soldiers into battle. If you want to play sports, play sports. But if you want to go to the lost sheep of Israel, come with me and leave that there. Thank you. I like that. That's a great Amen. Now that I have your undivided attention, that definitely didn't fit the command, though, did it? Uh, here's a thought for you, and this is a very serious thought. Maybe God's protection in our Christian lives is in the form of virtue and not miracle. By that I mean... We go into our Christian lives and we have this idea that God's gonna protect us. God's gonna watch over us. God's gonna put a hedge of blood about us and nothing bad will happen to us. In fact, in this very passage, Jesus kind of alludes to that by saying, I have every hair of your head numbered. You're all good. Yet he's telling them to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You see, how do they get through this dangerous mission they're on? Is Jesus gonna put a bubble around them? Or is he going to equip them with the virtue necessary to avoid the sharp edges of the cave as they dive through it? Maybe God's protection of the apostles was wisdom from above instead of a hedge of blood. We want God to protect us. 
from adversity, from pain, from sorrow, from difficulty, while being foolish with our finances, while being foolish with our relationships, while being uh, irresponsible with the word of God. And we think, well, you promised to protect me. Uh, No, he didn't, but he offers you virtue that if you have wisdom, you're going to avoid dangerous areas. You follow me? Jesus said in John chapter 13, a new commandment I give unto you, meaning it's not optional, meaning this isn't something that's open for debate, it's not negotiable. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Huh. God rarely protects us from getting hurt, but he always offers us the virtue that prevents us from staying hurt. Did you get that? He says to us, I command you to love one another. I don't want to. I command you to love one another. Fine. So when somebody hurts you because people hurt us, God doesn't protect us from getting hurt. God doesn't protect uh, us from our spouses hurting us, our parents hurting us, our siblings. But people hurt us. Strangers hurt us. Life hurts us. But people hurt us. And God doesn't stop that. Have you noticed that? But he commands us to love one another. If we obey that command, you can't hurt me. I just became invincible emotionally, spiritually. You can't hurt me. Some of you have tried. You can't because I love you. You see, the command from my commander makes me durable, sustainable. We think he should protect us by his divine power when he gives us his divine virtue and we have it within us. I hope that makes some sense to you because Jesus, for that reason, for that reason, does not feel bad commanding us to love one another. He does not feel bad by telling us we ought to love each other because we need it. You know, love never fails. Charity never fails. So you can't lose. You can't lose. Would you rather have God keeping you in a bubble through life or would you have, rather have God give you an invincible, a shield that makes you invincible because it's love? It's a command. It's a command. Number three, and this is what I'd like to really finish and emphasize with. We'll get through it real quick. Verse 34. Number three, Jesus is the commander of a righteous war. Verse 34, some of the hardest verses to understand about Christianity. Jesus already told him to go ye, he told him to be ye, and now he's going to say in verse 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Like what? I mean, I, I sung the Christmas songs. I read the prophecy. You're the prince of peace. He just says, I didn't come to give peace. I came to bring a sword. Huh. Verse 35, he explains himself when he says, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He didn't need our help for that. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Verse 37, he says, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What is Jesus saying? Now, he's not teaching that he came uh, 2,000 years ago to be born of a virgin so that he could destroy Joseph and Mary's marriage. And that as he went to school, he would intentionally get all the rabbis upset with their wives and break their marriages up and then go to the playground and get siblings against each other and destroy families. That's not at all what he's saying, obviously. Division was not the reason Christ came, but it would be the result of why he came. We know he came to give his life a ransom for many that they might be saved. We know that he came to give his life for people, the lost, lost souls to find him and to find forgiveness. But here's the problem. In a culture that has been for centuries embedded into one religion by the name of Judaism, when he comes and rescues one out of Judaism, 
he just tore that family apart. You'll notice he talks about fathers and sons and mothers and daughters more than anything. Why is that? Because when, when Simon Peter gets a conversion to Christianity, he, he becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, you have family members that we don't read about that aren't too happy about that. It's uh, equivalent to a denomination of Christianity, especially here in the Northeast, that has had a stronghold on families in particular in the Polish and Irish and, and, and Italian uh, ethnicities that for centuries it is synonymous with family. Your traditions are centered on that, on that religion. Your get-togethers are centered on that tradition. So when someone says, I don't want to be that anymore, the mother and father say, how dare you? I raised you to be this way. If you leave us now, you leave everything. You leave Papa, you leave Nana, you leave everything. And there is variance in a family. Why? Because Jesus rescued somebody out of it. So Jesus did not come to start a war. He came to fight in a war that had started back in Genesis chapter 3. And he had come to save sinners of, of their sin. And while doing that, he would create enemies. He came to save enemies and make them friends. But in so doing, he created more enemies. Not intentionally, but that is the way the gospel works. And why is Jesus telling his disciples this? He didn't want them to think he came to make everybody happy. He didn't want them to think that he came to make everything wonderful. He wanted them to know Christianity is not about unicorns. It's not about fluffy pillows. It's not about gumdrops. It's not about a dinosaur dancing and singing songs. It's not about making everybody happy. It's about saving the lost. And when we save the lost, we're going to upset many of those family members. And gentlemen, he says to them, gentlemen, we are in the middle of a war. A war he did not start, but a war he would fight. Having not served in the military or, of course, then not seen any battle, I'm left to just documentaries, pictures, my imagination, and movies, but I envision in my mind what a battle scene is like on some foreign land or even in our own backyard here early in American history, but I imagine that the, the war room was not a place of formalities. It was not a place where the generals had their feet up on the desk and they were sipping a cappuccino. I imagine they weren't on their smartphones just surfing uh, the internet for fun and talking about sport facts. I imagine in a war room, in any war throughout the world, there is a sense of tremendous urgency. That when someone comes into that office, it is not a time for chit-chat, it's a time for orders. And the commanders of every military, they are looking at the war, they are looking at their strategy, and they are commanding that man and that woman and that man and that woman and that man to do and to go and to be. And this is a time of urgency. And I want you to know that if you went into heaven today, I don't think it's a place where you have clouds and harps and people just kind of floating around loving life. It is a war room in heaven. Uh, there are angels and armies of angels and, and spirits and, and orders being given. Why? Because souls are hanging in the balance. People are dying every day and they are going to hell and they are going to heaven. And every soul that goes to hell is a heartbreak to God. And he's been on a rescue mission for thousands of years. And the church needs to wake up. The church needs to get on board. The church needs to stop sitting around and being lazy. The church needs to stop sitting around and caring about our feelings. Jesus will command us to go without consideration of our feelings, of our schedule, of, of our, our ambitions, because this is a serious, serious war. I have great concerns about the post-pandemic church. I have been confronted with it in recent months, and I believe for very, for very specific reasons, three to be exact, the church is in great danger. Great danger. One of which is spiritual laziness and apathy. We all sat here and condemned the world for not working. We all sat here and condemned the world for not getting back to work. But in reality, Christians love the couch as much as non Christians. We love to sit around and soak life up and put things in perspective, and the church is having a hard time getting back to work. 
The gears are moving very slow. Never before have our churches had greater needs for pastors, Sunday school teachers, ministry leaders, soul winners, nursery workers, volunteers to do whatever the church and ministry needs. I do believe objects at rest tend to stay at rest. But I fear what has happened is Christians have gotten sucked into this idea that the pandemic helped us to slow down and put things in perspective, that we shouldn't be so busy doing this and doing that, and we need to take more time for mental health, and we need to take more time for fun, we need to take more time for family even, because you only live once, and the pandemic really helped us to put that in perspective. And I would agree with some of that. But there is a battle waging with a commander commanding. And we have fallen into the trap, we being Christianity, of telling Jesus, chill out, dude. Chill out. We shouldn't be so busy. We shouldn't be so active. Our feet gotta go up, bro. I mean, we learned this in the pandemic. It's just a much easier life. Where, do you, does anyone know if there's a hole in the world somewhere where all of the laborers fell into? Are you, I mean, are you as puzzled as I am every store you go into and they're complaining about workers? And like, I watch the news. I know people perish and that's tragic. I understand that. But most of the stores that are requiring laborers are, for example, fast food places, which are typically younger people. And I ask myself, okay, I get that you were milking the government for months, but we're two years into this. Where'd y'all go? I'm starting to be a conspiracy theorist. I do think they were zapped into Saturn or something, but where'd they all go? Right? Here's the scary thing. Jesus is asking the exact same question about the church. My sister, who is our administrative assistant, she's on a number of of groups online for some of the communications, and she learns about different things with that. And and I was talking to her recently about some of our volunteer needs here and the service needs that are that are big and they're growing. And she said, "Oh, it's everywhere." She says everybody's saying the same thing. It's universal. What happened? Twenty twenty happened. We got comfortable, and we got our minds distracted. We started to think, yeah, you only do live once. Live up. And Christ is in heaven, still on the same rescue mission he's been on since he died on the cross. And he is commanding and commanding, and we are saying, relax, get a corona, chill out. It's dangerous. I know I'm I'm exaggerating to get your attention, but this is what's happening. This is what is absolutely happening. Now is not the time to do less, my friends. It's the time to do more. Now is not the time to give Christ less effort. It is time to give him more effort. Paul said, finally, 2,000 years ago, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If his strength was enough 2,000 years ago to keep us going, to do more with less as they did, listen, back 2,000 years ago, Paul was telling people to be strong in the Lord, and they didn't have air conditioning, they didn't have cozy mattresses, they didn't have all these benefits that you have at your businesses, they didn't get all the, all the money and all the conveniences that we have. If he was saying, be strong in the Lord, keep fighting, keep going, uh, the strength of God was good enough back then, it would be good enough for us today. And so Jesus Christ, yes, he's the gentle shepherd. Yes, he's the lover of our soul. Yes, he is that gracious, merciful Savior, but he is also the commander who is responsible for the greatest rescue mission in eternity. He is responsible for his army of soldiers, the royal priesthood, and he is responsible to wage war with Satan and the spirits of this world for the souls of men, and therefore he is the commander and chief of the church. Let us see him for who he is, 
Let us hear him for what he says. And he is not afraid to command us to serve. And I think what we might be hearing from him if we listen carefully is he is commanding us to drop our toys and pick up our swords. We may not like hearing that, but, but would you see it from his perspective? See it from his perspective. We might be more apt to obey him. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.